Well, it's good to see such, such a good turnout. I thought there'd be 10, 20 people here. This is great. I also thought we'd have snow or fog or something that would uh, happen when they asked me to come to the library to do this. Um, if you want to switch to the next slide. I'm going to go over a little bit about silica. This is actually uh, it's a graphic, graphic from OSHA. And if it's silica, it's not just us. People need to remember that. People think of, well, you know, you're going to hear comments from a variety of individuals. Well, that's just dust. Well, it's not just dust. It has a lot more to it. And we're going to go into why it's not just dust. Here's a slide. If you were to look at this, um, a close-up of the silica sand that they like to use for fracking is in the lower right corner. Um, some of the washed silica is up above. You can see when it's washed, it's this nice, clear, translucent substance. And you can see it's, it's overlaying uh, just conventional sand on the left-hand side. They're, they're regular sand and silica are not one and the same. So people need to keep that in mind. Next slide. So why, are the, why is the frac sand in, in industry so interested in our sand? It's because it's round. When they want to pipe it down, it doesn't stick. They can pump it down, get into the wells, get into the shale, and it helps prop that open. Uh, it's hard. It has an 8,000 PSI compression strength. A lot of sand just kind of crumbles and it's not going to work for that use. People in the back are having a hard time hearing. Is there a volume you can turn up or? No, no, no. I don't know. It pulls yeah. up. You can pull back up. Is this better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. And the other thing is that it's plentiful. Next slide. So if you take a look, this is a slide that made it very obvious. The um, All of the colored areas are where we have uh, the sand available. But if you take a look at the areas that are in red that involve Winona County, Olmstead County, Fillmore, and Houston, um, most of that is very close to the surface. When it's close to the surface, it's quick and easy to mine, and therefore there's less expense involved with mining it. So that's why they're so interested in ours over some of those other counties. Next slide. So what? Why is, why is silica risky? Um, when there's dust, it, it consists of multiple different sized particles. And our bodies are designed such that we do a very good job on anything greater than 10 microns of clearing that out. Uh, we have our nasal passageways, we have the back of our pharynx, you have your larynx and the bronchial tubes. All of those are very effective clearing mechanisms for the dust particles that are greater than 10 micrometers in size. Um, you have a clearing mechanism of all that mucus that just basically clears that out of the lungs, brings it up, and it goes into the stomach where it really doesn't do any harm. When they're less than 10 microns in size, they can make it all the way down into the air sacs. And I've got some slides on that uh, coming up here, so next. I want to show you, you know, what's 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 10 microns? What's two and a half microns? What, what am I talking about? Uh, that shaft there is a hair. That's one strand of hair. If you are to look at what's showing up over here, this is like standard sand that you're going to find on the beach. It's rough. It's large. But when we start talking about some of the silica sand, if you take a look at those larger round things around the hair shaft, that's 10 micrometers in size. So that gives you a, 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 a somewhat of an idea of how small 10 micrometers in size. And we also have things that are called PM10s and PM2.5s, the particulate matter. Well, those little moons around that little bead, that's 2.5 microns in size. So that gives you a, a ballpark idea of what we're talking about with size of these particles. Next slide. This is just a, a pictograph of, of what the lungs are to show you what it is. You know, your, your airways are kind of branched like a tree. And when you get to the very, very fine branches, then finally you get these little air sacs. And you have basically billions of these air sacs in your chest 
that are involved with gas exchange. That's where the fine particles get that become problematic. Next slide. Here's a couple of, you don't want, ever want to have your, your old lungs up on a picture like this because they're autopsy specimens. Um, most of the time your lungs are very pink. When early on in the course of this, it tends to be more whitish as time advances and it gets more scarred down. It's more like the example on the right hand side. Um, We'll go to the next stop slide and I'll kind of try to explain a, a, a few things. We do know that silica is a class one carcinogen. What is class one? Um, various things are, are classified on the basis of what are their chances of causing cancer. Three, there's no good evidence. Two, it's probable. One, it's the real thing. It causes cancer. So we do know that it, silica is a class one car carcinogen. It can cause chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Early on in this process, it can affect airways, break, have air sacs break down so that it's hard to exchange air early on in the process. And it's also involved with various autoimmune diseases, and I've got some of them listed there scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Wagner's granulomatosis, IgA nephropathy. Scleroderma is a thickening that you get under your skin or your mucous membranes and it um, causes a lot of problems. Most people know what rheumatoid arthritis is. It's an inflammatory arthritis. Lupus is kind of like rheumatoid arthritis with a lot of other features thrown in on top of it. Wagner's granulomatosis Lomatosis is something where it affects the kidneys, the nasal passageways, the lungs, and an IgA nephropathy is something where it, where it affects the kidneys. Next slide. So what's, spe what's special about silica? Next slide. So I want everybody to remember this. Silica is not just dust. We'll move on to the next. So what happens when these silica particles get down into those air sacs? Uh, silica isn't digestible by the macrophages. We have these um, Pac-Man-like cells that are in our bodies that go around and they pick out substances that, should, that don't belong there. Uh, they do a very good, mech, uh, good job on most things that you would inhale in your lungs that would get down into the air sacs. But there's some things like asbestos. It, they don't like asbestos, they don't like silica. If they get too much silica, they'll actually autolysize, they'll actually break down, and that causes a rather marked inflammatory response in the lung and causes a lot of scarring. So basically, silicosis is scarring of the lungs. So when someone comes in, and if I had a patient come in to see me that has silicosis, I can't give him something to reverse that disease. You try to do things with inhalers or with other products to try to make their breathing a little bit easier. This type of disorder doesn't respond all that well to those. And when it gets further along, your only option is a lung transplant if you even have that option. Um, so it's, it's, it's a bad thing to get and certainly it's something that we would like to do everything possible to avoid it from happening. Next slide. So what's the limit? How much silica can you be exposed to and it not be a risk? That's, I put up there, that's the million dollar question. It really is. Um, we don't have studies of sand mines going with 300 trucks or 200 trucks entering and leaving a day over 50 or 100 years to go to to say, well, what actually happens around these silica mines? What you have to do is you have to extract data that are from mines, and a lot of the mines may be gold mines, they may be different type of ore mines or hard rock mining, and there are studies that are out there, and I, I highlighted one of them by Christ and Zen. The study was over 41.6 years. I mean, the tough thing in medicine is, is to find anybody that wants to do a study over five years. So here you have one that looks at 41.6 years. They looked at people that had an expo exposure level of 50 micrograms per meter cubed, and people that were in that industry that were the miners, 
out of every 100 workers, there'd be 30 cases of silicosis. At a level of 100 micrograms per meter cube, there'd be 90 cases per 100 workers. So that is, you know, you can see that there's a, a fair drop off when you get down to the 50 micrograms, but that's far from anything close to acceptable. Next slide. Another thing about limits, there are six states that have published limits of what is acceptable for silica. Minnesota and Wisconsin are not two of the states, neither is Iowa. Um, and I, I'll talk about some of, some of these. The state of California has probably had theirs close to the longest. And they did research studies around sand and gravel mines. And mind you, these are probably ones that are not used to the same extent that, that ours are. And they set up a standard of three micrograms per meter cube as a maximal exposure risk. That's how much of this silica dust is allowable at the border of a mine site. They require monitoring of the air around all sand mines and processing plants. Now the other states that have these standards, they have a standard but they don't have mandatory monitoring, um, but at least they set a standard. So next, why are standards important? If you take a look at this, you can kind of see there's a little variance in how many cases appear where in the United States. And this is from uh, CDC's website. And you can see that uh, the darkest orange color is the worst areas. The white colors are the best. As you notice, California, which has and monitors, is white. Minnesota is um, one step down from Wisconsin in terms of silica risk. And, and you know, death rates are in deaths per million per year. It's not a large number, but if you're one of them, it's a large number. Um, and this was looking at between 96 and 2005. So if you, know, you want to make a, a dent in cases happening, you've got to do something to avoid the, the silica exposure. Next slide. So sorry about the math on this slide, but I, I, I thought we needed to go through it anyway. Uh, NIOSH is, work is, is like part of OSHA. They set standards of what people can be exposed to to on the mine sites. And they set an exposure limit, which is called a reasonable exposure limit, as being 50 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, and with the math there, you can see, I mean, a meter cubed is about like a, a cubic yard. And on an average work day, a person's going to inhale 10 cubic meters of air, just breathing in and out. And that's how much silica they're exposed to, or that equals 500 micrograms of silica. What, what, what's 500 micrograms of silica? Next slide. That's 500 micrograms of silica. It's not a lot. So that much coming into your lungs per day is, is, uh, is their maximal exposure limit. Next slide. Here's, here's a big challenge with silica. Silica is a spectrum of diseases. It's not just one disease. If you have a worker that's exposed to a, a high intensity level of silica, they could potentially come down with this in a year. Most people that get exposed to silica, it takes 40, 50, 60 years to show up. So someone like me, I get exposed to it, I'm probably not gonna make it to 110. It may not impact me, but my kids, my grandkids, absolutely. So when they looked, this is again from the CDC website, between 93 and 2006, uh, they looked at when were people exposed to silica that came down with it in that interval of time between 93 and 2006. So the exposures, um, it's hard to read from back there, but this is 1930 to 1939, 40 to 49, and so forth. Uh, so you're talking about a 50 to 60 year lag time. So it's one of those things. Uh, if anyone thinks these sand mines are going to be around under the same ownership and be liable for this when something happens to people, 
it's not going to happen because it, it just takes so long for this to appear. Um, that won't make the lawyers happy at all. Next slide. So it's just the construction workers and the people that work in the mines, right? Well, not really. Um, this again is from the CDC website. It just looked at cases in California by occupation. At the very top of this, uh, there were six people that acquired silicosis that were in managerial and professional specialties. They're not sitting out there down in the mine being constantly exposed to this. The technical, sales, and administrative people, there were two of those. Next category was farming, forestry, and fishing. Well, now, I don't know where they are by the mines, but there were three of them that came down with this. And the rest of them were more or less people that worked right in and with it and would be protected by the exposure limit risks that are at and on the sites by NIOSH and OSHA. But the other people, I, I, I think it's very questionable of, of how they were protected. And it, it'd be real tough. It, it'd be interesting to know uh, what kind of exposure they had. but but this shows that there's a risk above and beyond just working with it. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about some facts and fallacies. And I've heard these statements when I've gone to township meetings, city meetings, and thereby the proponents of it. And you know, you have to bite your tongue to not reply immediately, but we'll go through this. So next slide. So, you know, well, they'll always say, well, industrial silica sand, that's safe. That's not the same as this other stuff. That's not the stuff that causes silicosis. And they say, well, we use the stuff that's between 20 and 70 microns in range, which they do. That's the stuff they want. But that's not what comes out of the ground, no matter what they say. It all is a mixture that comes out. Um, and if, if you think about this, you would think that, well, the 20 to 70 micron sized particles should be safe. They have a high compression strength. That's what they apparently load in these trains to then haul out to the mine sites. And we'll come back to this. It, you know, it, it sounds like it should be safe, but and I kind of thought that until there was some more information that came out. So if you look at the side of a bluff around here, that's about what it looks like. If you look at that sand very finely in your hand, you can see there's multiple grain sizes. There's no one layer of sand in there that's all in the ball bearing 20 to 70 millimeter size. So when they say they leave the rest alone and they don't even take that out of the ground, that's 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 bogus. Next slide. And the other thing is, is if that was all they were taking out of the ground, why are they hauling 25 to 50 percent of it back to the mine site? That's the fines, that's the leftover stuff, that's the stuff, that's the risky stuff, because part of that is the sub-10 micron material that, that is at risk for, for us. So there, there, there is some truth that in a layer of sand within a bluff within those 80 feet, the top layers have more of the larger molecules of sand, but it doesn't matter where you get it from, it's always a mixture. Next. So, remember I mentioned about them saying that it's safe and it's this nice big size and well that size doesn't cause a problem? Well, in June there was a report by Eric Eswine. He's works uh, with OSHA and NIOSH that said that people that were working on these sites that were putting this sand into the ground and were working around this were even with the respirators on were being exposed to five times the, the REL, the upper limits of what they should be being exposed to. And you can kind of see uh, all that that isn't fog in the air, that's silica dust in the air on, on both of those pictures. Pretty much 100% silica dust. Next slide. So they looked at, at sample sites, samples at these various sites where they're putting this into the ground. Mind you, this is the stuff that they're here. And people here are telling you, well, when it's, after it's washed, it's safe. And out of 116 air samples, 92 exceeded the particulate matter two and a half micron limit 
and when they looked at the um, um, within that 116 samples, 31 percent exceeded it by a factor of 10. So even when people were working with this and they were wearing their air purifiers, they were being exposed to way more than they should. This again has to do with, with out there at the mine site, but it points out the fact that no matter what is done with the silica, it's probably never truly safe. Next. So another comment that you'd hear, well, it's you know, it's the same sand as they have in sandbox, and nobody in a sandbox comes down with silicosis. Well, that's kind of true. You don't get silicosis from playing in a sandbox. And I, sand isn't really different, at least around here. I think most people get the sand from the same place as the sand mines do. But I don't know, those two pictures look a little different to me. <laughs> next, next slide. What's the difference? It's magnitude, you got less than a cubic yard of sand in that sandbox, you've got thousands of cubic yards. Most of these mines are looking to mine one to two million cubic yards a year. That's a lot more sand. Kids play in the sandbox for an hour, these sand mines are operating 16 hours a day. Um, and you do a little more agitation and manipulation with a front end loader, crusher, and blaster than you do with a hand shovel and a plastic bucket. So, you know, it, it, you can't equate the two because you're talking about magnitude, duration, and, and, and different manipulation of it. Next slide. So, you know, you'll also hear, well, there's no monitors for this, so we, we shouldn't monitor it. We don't need to monitor it. It's not a concern. Well, there are monitors. There are ones that can uh, monitor the uh, particulate matter 2.5 microns down to a side down to a level of 0.5 microns per meter cubed. It's not perfect, but it's it's pretty good. Um, and those things can operate for 24 hours without any battery change or anything. And certainly, they could have electricity to them and run longer. There's some maintenance involved with them to be able to put. Uh, material inside of them to do their monitoring, but um, they're already doing some of this uh, to some extent in Wisconsin on a research basis. Next slide. So there's a site by Chippewa Falls, it's the EOG site. Crispin Pierce is a professor or assistant professor at uh, UW Eau Claire, and he is done some starting to do some studies on this. I um, contacted him, and uh, we talked a little bit about this. They're studying the, some of the particulate matter. Next slide. So here is was actually an industry-sponsored study. I mentioned that there are. This is the the California limit is is at the three micron level. Texas has a limit at the, the 0.27 micron level, even though they don't monitor it and always follow it. A lot of di big difference in the standard. Those dots are what actually was found at those sites when they tried monitoring that. So if you take a look at the OG site and of that box for the California, it's the lower line that, that indicates where that level is at, probably a third of those are above the acceptable limit. If we were basing on California, when you don't have a standard, what what do you what do you compare it to? You have to have a standard. Uh, next slide. So, as I mentioned, six states have standards. California's is three microns. Texas is 0.27. That's about a tenth of what California's is, and New York has one that's 0.06, which again, that's uh, compared to California's, that's 1 50th. Um, I'm not sure who's right there, I, but any of them are better than nothing. And that's something that I think has to be pushed for at the state level. This has to be studied. Uh, you know, it would be nice to know from every one of those states what data did they use to come up with their standard? 
and I think there has to be a realistic standard. I do think there is an acceptable limit below which people are safe. <clears throat> but where that limit is, is, is tough. I mean, you can peruse the literature all you want, and you're going to have a hard time uh, finding that. Next slide. Um, we'll move on to a little different topic, and it's not a different topic. It has to do with the polyacrylamide. Um, first time I went to a talk by the sand company or by the, their engineer, he said, well, we use polyacrylamide, and that's safe. It, it, it's, it's not harmful. They use it in waste treatment plants. Farmers use it. It's used all the time. It's no big deal. Okay, so you go home and you read on it a little bit, and it's like, well, even in the, the brand new container, there's just a touch of acrylamide, acrylamide, not much, but then you look at the literature and you find um, with the physical properties of polyacrylamide, if it's subject to shear force, that's like if you rub something over the surface, that's a shear force. Like if you're taking sand and putting it through a sieve, that's what a sand processing facility does. Shear forces will break down polyacrylamide. Heat breaks down polyacrylamide. Um, at a sand processing facility, a lot of times they need to dry the sand before they ship it. And they use a lot of, whether it's propane or natural gas, to dry the sand. But they're in introducing a fair amount of heat. and then. There still is a, a certain amount of particulate matter that comes off of those dryers. And they, there are ways that they can mitigate some of that, but I've not seen anything that says, we took a sample of this, and what percent of it is silica? Some of it's going to be burned hydrocarbon from the natural gas, but at, at any rate, some of that's coming off. So you've got, with the acrylamide, there's going to be a component of that that can get into the air. Um, that needs to be monitored. There's, we don't know how much that is. I've not seen any data anywhere of how much that is. We may find out that it's not a concern, but it's just because no one's tested it doesn't make it not a concern. You have to test it and say it's not going to reach levels that are going to be problematic to say it's not going to be a concern. Um, acrylamide, which is a breakdown product from polyacrylamides, a neurotoxin, it can cause a peripheral neuropathy. That's where your feet go numb. It can cause problems with the brain so that you might not think straightly, straight. Um, both of those are not good things to have, and you, we need to limit exposure to that. There are ways of mitigating this, but they don't even want to talk about it. You can't mitigate anything until you talk about it. Next slide. So other things that acrylamide can do, if it's exposed, polyacrylamide when it's exposed to sunlight will actually break down to acrylamide. But on the other, also acrylamide will break down with UV exposure to something that's not toxic. But there's a window of time for five or 10 days where you get a level that goes up about five fold so again, it's one of those things that needs to be monitored. There's truth to the fact that you know farmers use it and they spread it on their fields along with um, their insecticides and pesticides. But when you put this on a field in a thin layer, it breaks down very quickly and absolutely no concern. If you use polyacrylamide in waste treatment plants, there's more monitoring that's happening there. They're not exposing it to the degree of heat. They're not exposing it to shear forces. And that's why it's not a concern on municipal treatment plants. The concern is you have these huge 200,000 gallon lakes of this chemical sitting on these sites that can potentially leak. But they never leak, would they? Next slide. Here's preferred sands, Blair, Wisconsin. There's a date on that, 5-4-2012. Uh, um, 38 sites in Wisconsin, six different leaks in one year. 
Um, and I don't know, I don't think anyone's thought about the acrylamide when, when these leaks happen. This actually went all the way down to that guy's garage um, that was down below this. Next slide. Uh, this is the Soderbeck mine near Grantsburg, Wisconsin. A hiker was out by the St. Croix River and he noticed this, this uh, murky substance in the river and wondered what the heck was going on and tracked it back to this mine that had been leaking for, for two to three days and no one, everyone failed to notice that this was happening. Um, you know, you can't let the mine do their own monitoring. Uh, there's a close up on the next slide that shows uh, where that leaked beyond that and it did get into the St. Croix River. I didn't hear a lot of follow-up about that, but obviously things like that are concerns. I mean, these things have to be designed a lot better. We need to know a lot more about what's sitting inside those ponds um, for safety's sake. Next slide. <clears throat> Diesel particulates. This was an eye-opener for me. I, you know, you hear a diesel and, and um, this summer, the World Health Organization classified diesel as a, a again, a class one carcinogen. And it, you know, they mentioned some things about in London, if you're riding a bike or walking the street, you have a 50% higher chance of having a heart attack than if you're in a car because of the exposure to the diesel hydrocarbons. But you know, you say, well, you know, that's that's just happening. Um, there is not happening here. Next slide. Um, actually, go back. I, I apologize. There's a little more on this. Um, in in the U.S. in 2000, there was an estimated 125,000 deaths related to diesel. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things like secondhand smoke. You, you really didn't. In the 70s and 80s, no one talked about secondhand smoke. You know, it was just one of those things. That's, you know, it's just the people that smoke. Well, this is kind of like that where uh, it's ubiquitous, but it's one of those things that people didn't recognize as a concern. Um, but it, it is a concern. So next slide. So there's a, a particular website that I went to. You can put in your zip code. So I did it for mine, which is in Winona, but I also included Houston County on this. So, so, uh, and it said that the lifetime cancer risk from diesel soot in your community exceeds the risk of all other air toxins tracked by the EPA combined. And of all U.S. counties, we're at the 80th percentile. So that's our baseline. That's where we're starting from. Um, and they said the average lifetime diesel soot cancer risk for a resident of Winona County is 1 in 22,418, and Houston County is one in, it's nearly the same, 1 in 22,424. Um, Houston County was the 74th percentile of all U.S. counties. This is already at a risk that's 45 times greater than the EPA's acceptable cancer level of 1 in a million for um, diesel particulates. Now, um, I, I've looked at a few EAWs. There's two out there in Winona County right now. One's the Yoder mine, the other is the Dabblestein. And buried in there, they talk about how much diesel they're planning on using per site. 500,000 gallons per site per year. That's a million gallons of diesel um, that would be contributed contributing to our air quality when those mines if those mines come into an exi existence. Um, I also said, well, you know, I try to find out how much diesel is used in Winona County. I, if someone can find that, that would be great. I did find out how much diesel we use in Minnesota. And it just says at the retail level, we sell 250,000 gallons of diesel a day. So that's in the entire state. So each of these mines would be using up a two-day supply of our diesel alone. So if we were to, you know, if we were to find out how much we had in our county, this is a huge increment in the amount of diesel use in our county. Next slide. This shows within Minnesota um, the relative risks 
the one with the green circles, Winona County, you can see Houston right below it, but you can kind of see that in our whole area of the state from the Twin Cities down, we're in a much higher risk area than the rest of the state. And so when they start saying that, well, these mines are out in the open, there's wind blowing, it's not a big deal. I don't know, I, looking at those numbers, I think it's a big deal to me. Um, next slide. You look at traffic and traffic safety reports and, you know, when they start talking about numbers of trucks and they say, well, you know, this, this road can handle 10,000 uh, vehicles a day and we're just going from 4,000 to 6,000. It's well within the limits of what the road can handle. Um, the road might be able, well, the road can't handle it because we already know they break down in two years instead of 20. But the other thing that, that happens is that if you take a look at any truck the size of these sand trucks, for every five accidents, there's one death. So, you know, that's not the same as running into another passenger vehicle if it happens. So that's, that's a concern from the traffic standpoint. And we'll go over here a little bit with regards to water quality. During mining, the diesel and hydraulic leakage, you know, they've already taken down that uh, sand level to a very low level above the water table. <clears throat> and there's a risk of that diesel and hydraulic fluid leaking. Uh, you know, it just amazes me on the EAWs. They say, well, the farm equipment does that too, so it's no different. Well, I don't know, you know, 50,000 or 500,000 gallons of diesel, some of that's being used on the site. Uh, that's not the same per square foot usage of diesel as, as one of those farm tractors running over it a few times a year. And then the other thing has to do with the chemicals being hauled back to the mine, uh, or the, the sand being hauled back to the mine, and, and really, so far, I haven't seen any data that says anything's been looked at for there for acrylamide content or anything else to say uh, what is it that's with the sand, uh, what kind of risk could that have. Next slide. This was interesting. On the, um, I didn't even think of this, but on the um, Minnesota Department of Health website, they had information on silica, and they talked about these mines potentially changing the pH of water. And you know that and I tried to do a little reading on uh, on that sense, and some of it, I guess, is actually during the mining process. Um, you always, they're peeling off layers of sand off of a bluff. They're exposing a new surface area. The sun hits that. Sulfites break down and ends up lowering the pH of the water down below. I don't know how much sulfite is in, the, is in this material, but when you start talking about changes in pH, um, that can have a huge impact. There, little changes in pH can have a huge impact on um, streams and drinking water. To what extent, I, you know, I, I can't say because I haven't researched that enough. And again, um, because you've got a thinner layer of sand, there's a higher risk of bacteria and chemicals going through that after they're done than what it was before. Next slide. So, we need, we need standards, we need regulation, we need things done at the state level that help us better understand what needs to be regulated and how. We need a, a standard for what's allowable for particulate matter, we need a standard for what's allowable for silica. Those don't exist at the current point in time, uh, but they need to. We need to have more decisions on what can be allowed for trucking and for what purposes when you start talking about diesel risks. I think the sand mine should have a monitor for every thousand feet of perimeter. Um, as the wind changes direction, so is the exposure to this dust, and you're not really gonna know what the downstream area of exposure is unless you have monitors in every direction that the wind blows. We've got to have the standards out there to go along with that, and it's got to be um, it's got to be open to the public. It's 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 like if the monitor could upload it to the internet and anyone could look at it, that would be the ideal circumstance because I would not trust the sand company saying, well, we put up the monitor and we check it, it's okay. 
process. Um, next slide. We need, monitor, we need to monitor the acrylamide that's in the pond water, the air that comes out of the drying facilities, the sand that's returned to the mine, and we need to minimize diesel use. I, I don't, you know, even if you have clean diesel, you can't say you're going to add this many trucks per day going 20 miles to haul sand um, as an acceptable limit. Next slide. And these are, you know, these recommendations, these are my opinion. These are not facts. This is not some body that said, uh, here's what needs to be done. I'm just saying, to me, this makes sense of what types of limits should happen. Uh, we need to get the regulation out there. To me, if you're going to allow this, it should be a rail spur that goes to the site you have your processing facility, you have your sand mine all together, and it should be in the least densely populated area possible. You're going to limit the amount of exposure to the people around it by doing this. Um, a train coming and going once a day is way more economically feasible for hauling this stuff than trucks are. Not only is it more economically feasible, um, but you also eliminate all that diesel particulate from ever being going into the atmosphere to begin with. Next slide. So back to the silica, it's not just dust, and, and there's a lot of truth in that statement. Next. So uh, do we want to take questions now or? Yes. Uh, 